The Harker Speaker Series, just to give you a little bit of background, um, we launched it in 2007 to bring in leaders and visionaries from a wide variety of fields to share their expertise or unique experiences with the Harker parents and the faculty and the students and as well as our greater local community. Um, one of the traditions in our series is to have our, for our guest speaker to be introduced by one of our students. So tonight, Harker senior Warren Zhang will be introducing Mr. Lanza, but before I invite Warren up to the stage, just a couple housekeeping things. I know that you all had a few minutes to be out there, so you probably found the restrooms, but if you need them, they're in the atrium and off to the right. Uh, Mr. Lanza is gonna speak for about an hour and then do a question and answer with you, a little bit of a discussion Q&A. And then after that, he will be available in the lobby to sign books if you are interested in that. So thanks again for coming, and Warren? Thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. I'm very excited to be here today to introduce author, educator, father, and blogger, Mike Lanza. Mike is the author of Playborhood, as you can see, Turn Your Neighborhood into a Place for Play. So he's worked very hard to create a rich uh, play life for his three children, one of whom is here right now, in Menlo Park, California. And he's also discovered and written about communities all over North America who are coming together to do innovative and vibrant things to ensure that their kids have a very rich life outside of you know, regular school things. And you know, before his writing career, Mike was also a five-time entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, and he also holds an MA in education, an MBA, and an MA and BA in economics all from Stanford University. So with that, please give a warm welcome to Mike Lanza. Well, that was a great introduction, Warren. Uh, I'm gonna try to stay with the mic, um, but I like to move around, so we'll see what happens. Um, thanks for coming today. Thanks for braving the, uh, the crowds going to the football game. I know that's an exciting thing, at least it was for me when I was a kid. So I'm just waiting for my little but I, I use my, okay, I'll just do it with my, my keypad. I use my iPhone to navigate my, uh, my presentation. Um, so uh, as Warren said, I'm the father of three boys. Uh, we're in Menlo Park, and um, Marco's here with me. Um, he's uh, kind of uh, congruent with what I'm, I'm doing in Playborhood and actually things that I'm doing for my next book. I'm, I'm uh, sort of encouraging Marco to be an entrepreneur, so uh, he's helping me sell books and signs, and he gets a little cut, uh, which uh, is the only reason he's here, because he's seen this presentation like four or five times, and uh, uh, he doesn't need to see it again. But he's a great prop. Um, so this is the book. Um, came out in April, Playborhood, Turn Your Neighborhood into a Place for Play. And um, what I have to say tonight really kind of tracks the book fairly well. There, obviously, there's a lot more information in the book. And we also have these signs, uh, you can see here. And uh, they're also uh, for sale, every, both are $10 each. Um, and the idea behind the sign is, you could put it uh, in front of your house, uh, you know, on a street, in, a, in the sidewalk, just to kind of tell people, hey, kids are here, uh, this is a place for kids to play. Okay. So um, I'm gonna start with what I call the, the Playborhood Manifesto. Um, I want my kids to play outside with other neighborhood kids every day. I want them to create their own games and rules. I want them to play big complex games with large groups of kids and smaller games one-on-one -on -one with the best friend. I want them to decide what, for themselves what to play, where, and with whom. I want them to settle their own disputes with their friends. I want them to create their own private clubs with secret rules. I want them to make lasting physical artifacts that tell the world that this is their place. I want them to laugh and run and think every day. That's what I had. It's my standard for a good childhood, and it's my goal for my kids. And I, 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 I feel this. I feel like I have to run away from the microphone sometimes. I hope that's okay audio-wise. Um, this is um, everything else. All the other photos you, you saw were uh, contemporary photos from the last couple of years. Uh, this one is from when I was a kid. Uh, that's me back in sometime in the late 60s. I was born and raised. That'll work? If you don't mind, it means Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was born and raised in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, we did have girls in my neighborhood. Uh, this happens to be uh, all, all boys. Uh, the reason I, I, I chose the photo, besides the fact that it, it is a pretty cool photo, um, is that it shows us in my backyard a uh, place where we had no fences. So uh, we had the opposite of what we see in Northern California. 
uh, where I grew up, we were not allowed to have fences in backyards. And that really facilitated play because kids could look around and they could just see across many, many backyards if someone was outside. And they could just come outside and, and join the other kids. Um, also, this street, so we're in my backyard. This street was between my house and the house across the street that had four boys and a girl. It's a great find for us. Uh, and that was our hangout. That was the place where we played football and softball. Uh, we we uh, played roller hockey, um, all sorts of things. That was one of the places where we could just go pretty much any time after school and there'd be somebody there to play with. So a uh, couple questions. Um, just like to know, the kids in your neighborhood play outside every day? One, one head and on, couple? Good. So for those of you who say no, do you, honestly, do you think it's possible in this day and age? You got a one head and on? Um, well, my job uh, today is to show you that it's possible and to show you how to make it happen. That's what I'm here to do. Um, and um, kind of you know, need to loosen you up a little bit and make you see a lot of examples first, and then I'm going to show you kind of a, a, a set of solutions to make it happen. So um, first I'll talk about the problem a little more, a little more rigorously. Then I'll give you some inspirational stories uh, so that you can get a sense of, you know, what other people in other parts of the United States, a lot about what we're, we're doing in our neighborhood uh, to make play happen. And then I'll provide some solutions. The problem. Basically, you know, there's many ways to characterize it. This is the way that most people talk about this problem of lack of play among children. They're doing too much of that and too much of this. Um, they're sitting in front of uh, screens too much. Uh, the statistics are mind-boggling. Uh, I think that the, the Kaiser Center, Kaiser Center or something like that, for, for, for research, Kaiser Family Foundation uh, research, says that kids are watching between 8 and 18, are watching screens and consuming uh, digital media between about eight hours a day. Eight hours a day, the average. Uh, it, it actually, uh, it does differ to some extent with race. So African Americans, Latinos are about 10 hours a day, and Caucasians and, and Asian Americans are about six hours a day. Uh, 10 hours a day is unbelievable, but even six is way too much. Um, you know, you think about it, if they're not doing it in school, if they're not doing it while they're sleeping, you know, they sleep, they go to school, and that's about all they do. That's the average. Um, and then they're doing this, and this is more prevalent, um, in other words, being chauffeured around uh, in adult-led activities. Um, this happens more with, uh, Afri with excuse me, with, with Caucasians, with uh, Asian Americans, with upper middle income uh, kids in general. They're scheduled, highly scheduled. Um, so what's missing is they have no time on their own in the world to do things. And when I think back to what was most fun in my childhood, what was actually, actually the most formative for me, it was being on my own with my friends in my neighborhood. That's what we did. Now that's almost eliminated from most children's lives. So that's one way to characterize the problem. So what? So a lot of people say, you know, this is 21st century and that's the way it is. And, you know, my kid's fine. My kid's, you know, out there uh, doing soccer and doing football and doing baseball and uh, dance. You know, there's, there's some measurable negative impacts of the lack of play. Um, one is obesity. You know, and I mentioned, you know, these adult led activities like, uh, like you know, uh, uh, team sports. Well, kids actually are fairly sedentary, most kids. Uh, in team sports because of all the time it takes to drive there, all the time it takes, you know, just standing on the sidelines, waiting for things to happen. Um, a lot of times you bring siblings along, so siblings aren't doing anything uh, while the kid who's playing is playing. Um, and then there's all this other stuff, all these other activities that kids do. They're watching TV as well. They're more obese because they don't play in their neighborhood. Um, there's depression. Depression um, is, I probably don't have to tell you, is, is epidemic uh, levels uh, among youth and young adults in America. Uh, it's increased, some people say, two or three times from what it was decades ago, and other associated emotional problems. Um, suicide is associated with that. It's a big deal where I live. Well, I, I live next to Palo Alto. Uh, Gunn High School's had quite a few suicides in the past few years. Um, creativity is something we can't really measure very well, but people tend to think that creativity is much less now than it was years ago. When kids were free to go out and do things on their own to make decisions for themselves, they were more creative. Um, and actually, this is re new research I'm doing for a new book about just helping, figuring out how parents can help kids be doers and be creative in the world and, and do things. Um, then there's non-measurable things that we think are diminished uh, because of the lack of play. One is life skills, uh, you know, being able to fix things, being able to cook, being able to clean, being able to you know, go to the store on your own, come back, navigate the world. Um, 
things like being able to, to manage money. Um, you know, kids aren't making money on their own. They're not cutting lawns. They're not, they're not uh, delivering newspapers. Um, and then there's social skills. So, um, you know, if you're in front of a screen all day, face-to-face -face social skills are not what they used to be. Being able to hold a conversation, it's not what it used to be. So these are all problems associated with the lack of play. Uh, but by the way, I, I'm, there's a small group here. I, I'm from the East Coast, so it's a bit where I talk about it. So if you want to slow me down or you, you want to, you know, disagree or you have a question, please raise your hand. Okay, I, I don't mind answering questions as we're going on. So the big thing I want to get across is this is a social problem. Okay, this is, you know, the way we, the, the way I framed the, the problem to start with was, oh, kids, you know, they're watching too much television, they're in too many uh, adult-sponsored activities. That's a, that's a good problem frame. The problem with that problem frame is, if that's the way you frame the problem, then your solution is, we're going to cut down on, the, on that television, right? We're going to cut down on those, on, on those, on those uh, activities after school. If you do that, and you say, kids, go outside, they go outside, they look around, there's nothing going on. Boring, right? Neighborhoods are boring. Um, so that's, that's the problem frame that I actually like to, to frame to, to come up with solutions is, rather than saying all these things that kids are doing are bad, let's say, you know, our responsibility is to make the neighborhood a compelling place, to make the neighborhood a place where kids want to be. Um, and that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in my solutions section. So now I'm going to give you some uh, stories of places. I'm going to talk a lot about my neighborhood, Menlo Park. Uh, Marco's going to be up there quite a bit. You'll get tired of hearing about Marco. Um, and then I'll talk about some other neighborhoods throughout the United States uh, that are doing some really cool things to bring kids outside. Um, so this is our, what I call, neighborhood family room in Menlo Park. Um, this is about, so what I did was I, and I'm going to talk a lot about sort of the physical changes we made to our yard, but there's a lot of, a lot of, you know, knocking on doors and talking to people and, and getting them to come outside as well. There's all the, the, the social side of it. Um, this is about halfway through our renovations of our front yard. The idea behind the renovations were, let's make this into a compelling place where kids want to be, where they want to hang out. Because we, we have parks that are four blocks away. We have two parks that are four or five blocks away. No one goes there. And I don't know what your experience is, but parks are pretty dead these days. Kids don't go to parks. Or if they go, all the kids, all the little kids are with an adult, one adult each. And the adults are standing over the kids, and the kids are, you know, it's not very exciting. It's not very fun. Um, so we're trying to make that hangout experience happen right where we live. And uh, like I said, it's about halfway through the, the, the renovations. And I'm going to focus in right first on this, this picnic table here. So we've got a picnic table in the front of our yard. Most people have picnic tables in the back of the yard. That's where they dine. Uh, but if you think about it, for some reason, you know, when you go to a great city, when you go to San Francisco, when you go to New York, when you go to Paris, you like to see people. And you don't even know these people. Why don't you want to sit in your front yard and see people you know? We think it's great. So we, we're out there two times a week, three times a week. We do all our birthday parties. We do all our family functions out there. And, you know, we see people. We, we wave. We say hello. Sometimes we see someone who we really want to see, and we ask them to come over. They have some wine with us. Um, it's my wife and her family here. Um, and uh, when our kids are tired of playing, they just run out in the driveway. They run out on the street. Other kids that are walking by join. You know, it, it's a big street party every time we eat in, in our front yard. It's a lot of fun. Uh, this is our driveway. So um, there's a beautiful painting there. Before I talk about the beautiful mural, I just want to talk about the surface. So when we moved in here, we had uh, pavers. So those, you know, like kind of bricks that a lot of people have. And people think, I, I actually don't quite understand, but people think they're very luxurious and beautiful to have pavers on your, your driveway. I think they're really horrible for kids, so we tore them out. Why are they not good for kids? Well, what do kids want to do on a driveway? What are you doing on the driveway, Marco? I swim around the park. I play basketball. He scooters. He rides his little plasma car. He plays basketball. He plays bouncy ball. They draw the sidewalk shots. They ride bikes. You can't do that on papers. All this fun stuff that kids love to do, you know, with wheeled vehicles, like those little wheels, they can't do it with papers. They can't play basketball because the basketball goes all over the place. Bouncy ball, they can't do it. So the first thing we did when we moved in, we tore out all the papers. We put in smooth cement. And I guess what I want to get you to think about is we looked at every square inch, every square foot, every square inch of our yard and thought, instead of what do other people think we should do with it too, how can we use this place? How can we use every, every square foot of our yard? And 
driveway's dead unless you can roll wheels on it. And this will come up actually later, how important it is for kids to roll little wheels on, on the driveway. Uh, also, the, the painting obviously is beautiful. It's a mural of our, of our neighborhood. That's our neighborhood, that's where we live. Um, that green rectangle there, that's our, our lot. Uh, I drew in all the lot lines, actually. And um, it's a great play space. It's a lot more pretty to, to, to look at than your, your average driveway. Also, um, you know, every one of these, uh, uh, these lots is, is just big enough for a, a Lego plate base plate. So you can put a house on any of those lots. So you can put a, a lot on where you live or where somebody else lives. Um, the streets are just right for Hot Wheels cars, Matchbox cars, HO trains, all that stuff. So it's a lot of fun. Um, this is our sidewalk, and that's my son Nico up there. Um, this, we have a neighborhood summer camp every summer uh, for one week every morning. Uh, kids from the neighborhood come around, and we just have lots of fun. This is one of our projects this, this summer. Um, we, we, kids chose different patterns, and then we had a, somebody, a friend of mine, draw out the patterns in chalk, and then the kids painted them in. So you're starting to get the sense, I hope, we're defacing everything we can. Okay? We want this place to look like kids live here. We want them to feel like they own this place. We don't want it to look like another boring suburban front yard. We want this to be a hangout. We want the kids to be really into being there. And they are. They're out every day. Um, this is our fountain. So um, I got this fountain because it's very low to the ground. It's got no sharp edges. Every toddler that walks by splashes their hands when it's nice out, when they splash their hands in the, in the fountain. Dogs lap up water. Uh, it's, a, it's an attractor. It's one of the things that actually, honestly, that we use to, to get people to start engaging with our yard. You know, the, the, the normal mentality in America is, oh, that's private property. I don't want to become involved. We're trying to break that culture. We're trying to get people, please, come, join us, have fun. And so the, the, the fountain is probably the most visible uh, thing, the, mo the, the thing that first attracts a lot of kids. Uh, this is a whiteboard. So along the right side of our front yard, um, I'd rather tear down the fence, but it's kind of hard with neighbors to tear down fences. So we put a whiteboard, 35 feet of whiteboard. And we have this, this box of dry erase pens, and we tell people, kids, please just draw on the whiteboard. We haven't gotten any bad stuff yet. Um, it's all good fun. Uh, we have a sandbox in the front yard. A lot of people have sandboxes. Ours is in the front yard. It's 10 feet away from the sidewalk. And again, we tell neighbors, please come. And it's interesting culturally. Please come. Use it any time. We don't have to be there. We happened to come home one day and this family was there. Um, it happens a lot. Uh, another thing that we like to do with the sandbox is, um, is I buy coin, you can buy foreign coins. We have all these great currencies that don't exist anymore. Or they're not tradable. So you could buy foreign coins that, from defunct currencies on eBay for like, you know, $10 for a couple kilos. It's pretty cheap. And so we just, Marco is, you know, lead, leads the pack and just burying coins all the time. And kids come by and they, they go through there and they grab coins. They take them home, so they get buried treasure. Um, this is a, a view from our garage of our driveway, and uh, this is uh, something called slot wood. We keep this slot wood. We keep this in our garage, and it's just like Lincoln Logs. Actually, I, I, the way I found it years ago was I did a, a web search, life-size Lincoln Logs. And this is the second hit. Um, so my desire is for kids to make things that they can inhabit on their own quickly and easily. So they can put together one of these things and take it apart half hour, hour max. If, you know, if they're not really good at it, it'll take them an hour. Um, we have a play river in the front yard. Um, and um, if you know little kids, some kids, they come over and this is it. You, you can't rip them away. Um, and, uh, we race corks down this thing. We race uh, little boats down this thing. Um, you're, you're starting to get the sense. There's a lot here. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, our, our street in front of our house, really, we, we consider it to be part of our neighborhood family room. And um, it really, we, we think of our, our zone as extending into the street. Um, so we don't think that streets are just for cars. I mean, I think it's, you know, that's, you, that's the cultural norm is your, 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 your property, where your zone ends at the sidewalk somewhere, and then streets are for cars. Our kids want to be in the street. We, we want them to be in the street, too. Um, this is an interesting picture, actually. This is my Nico, my son Nico. He's four and a half now. This is about a year ago. He was about three years and nine months, three years and ten months old. And he's got no training wheels. 
interesting story about Nico learning how to ride a bike without training wheels. Um, he, this is pretty amazing, he taught himself how to ride a bike without training wheels before he was four. We can hear it, Mark, okay? Okay. He taught himself how to ride a bike without training wheels before he was four years old. He had three things, three, three key ingredients. He had inspiration. Marco, his older brother, great bike rider, riding all the time. So he sees his brother riding around, up and down the street, to school, all that. So he had inspiration. Second thing he had was a prepared environment. Smooth driveway, okay? Lots and lots of wheel, wheel vehicles in the garage. Many wheel vehicles, many bikes, tricycles, this plasma car. Yes, Marco? Uh, I forgot what it was. It's okay. So he had inspiration, he had a, a prepared environment, and he had freedom. We don't hover over our kids. Mark was out there on the street, Nico's in the garage, hours every afternoon. I came home day after day, and I'd see him on this wheel vehicle, and this wheel vehicle, and this bike, and this plasma car. He rode, he rode the Razor a lot. Then one, time, one day I came home, he's on one of those balance bikes. You know a balance bike, it's got no pedals? I knew he was ready. So I put him on, I took the, the training wheels off this bike, I put him on it in 10 minutes, he's on his own. So it's, kind of, it's really interesting what kids can do if you give them those things, if you give them freedom, if you give them a prepared environment, if you give them some inspiration, kind of show them the path. They can do a lot of things on their own. So this is our backyard. Um, lots more fun stuff. We've got this in-ground trampoline. Okay? So it's a trampoline where you, know, you don't have to climb up the ladder into this cage and stay in the cage. You know, Marco here, he's running on the grass, he's playing a game on the grass, then he just runs onto the trampoline, then he runs off. And we've got these beanbag couches all around. Um, it's really fun. And another thing, another thing they do, by the way, is we, we did this today, is we'll take the springs off of the trampoline and they have a little kind of shack in there underneath the, the trampoline. Yes, Marco? Uh, and I'd like to do tricks with He's good at doing flips. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you have your own trampoline. Okay, so we have a playhouse, a wonderful playhouse. Lots and lots of fun. Um, and it's a prefab that we sort of changed everything, changed all the dimensions. I want to focus on the inside. Uh, this is the second floor. It's a pretty big playhouse. So I put drywall, I, I put whiteboard all on the first floor. So that's where kids can draw. Marco, try not to draw attention to yourself, okay? Okay. And then on the second floor, we put drywall. And we painted it. And we thought, you know, this is great. Kids will draw all over that, white, that, that, uh, that whiteboard. What happens? They draw over everything. Not only the whiteboard, but all the, all the drywall upstairs, all the, the painted wall. Um, so I was pretty upset about that at first. And then I looked around, and I looked at what they were drawing. It's amazing stuff. I mean, it's like, a, you know, it's like, like cave paintings from thousands of years ago. Kid, there's really deep culture in these walls. I mean, kids writing about each other. Uh, there's, one, there's two different enemies lists. There's you know, top 10 enemies of, of different kids uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, there's um, stuff about, you know, remember me always, and one girl who was moving, she talked about how much she loves where she lives, and she wrote about uh, the people that she's going to miss. It's beautiful. It's great. And it's all over the playhouse now. All over the inside and all, now on the outside. And that's been up for three years. And this is our family, family room. What do I mean? This is the inside of the house. My point here is that, yeah, we spent a lot of money on the, on the outside of the house. But we spend, and I mean zero, we spend zero on the inside. So it's not about how much money you spend. It's about your priorities, about your, your sense of proportion. For us, the inside of the house doesn't matter. We don't care. We live in one of the best climates in the world. We want our kids to be outside. By the way, don't, they don't watch television. We, we're pretty, we're, we're, we're radical. We don't have television to watch. So, and they don't have an interesting inside of the house. They, they have things they could do in the winter when it's raining, but they like to go outside pretty much all the time. Uh, this couch, the story behind here is, you know, we, we haven't spent any money on anything, including furniture. My wife had this for many years. It's a crappy couch with imitation leather. And a couple years ago, the legs were starting to rattle a little bit. So I ripped the legs off. That's our couch. You know, we live in a nice, beautiful home in Menlo Park. We got this great outdoors. We got crappy furniture inside. That's, that's our priorities. Um, so now I'm going to go on to some other neighborhoods and talk about them. Um, so we've gone from Menlo Park, which is one of the most affluent places in the United States, to South Bronx. South Bronx is, is certainly one of the most poor places in the United States. Um, in the 2010 census, 49% of kids were below the poverty level. It's got horrible crime, horrible drug problems, you know, graduation rates in the 
I think, you know, 20% or something like that for high school. Not a good place. But this block called Lyman Place is a wonderful oasis. Uh, it's, it's just a wonderful place. And it's all really due to this woman here, Hetty Fox. Hetty uh, grew up on Lyman Place. And she went off to California. She went off to Cal State Northridge to teach for a couple years. Uh, and then she came back. And since 1970, she's devoted her entire life to making that one block where she lives a better place to live. And the one thing I want to illustrate here is this is a play street. So she has been working, uh, really, she just petitions with the city of New York and the, the police department. She's been doing this for 36 years, 36 or 37 years, to block off the street, to make it a play street from 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, through the summer. And she does it all. I mean, she, has, she hires youth workers to help remove stuff, but I mean, she's the, she's the enforcer. And um, so you see all the things that are going on. There's a basketball hoop up there. There's a volleyball net. There's uh, game tables. There's a girl uh, on a skateboard. There's a guy just lounging there. Um, Lyman Place is, is honestly one of the most warm, wonderful places to be anywhere. And it's in a place that people normally think is, is, a, is a very dangerous ghetto. But it's just the, the, the camaraderie there is wonderful. And besides the fact that they have this play street, another reason is that Hetty, her her strategy beyond the play street has been to pull in extended families and get them back living there. So when you're in public housing, a lot of the housing there is public housing, they just kick you out and you know you don't know why, and you don't have much control over where you go. She's worked with the city of New York to actually kind of choose families to bring them back. And so this boy here, Jacob, ja Jacob. yeah, Jacob, um, well, he's got about, I think, 13 or 14 extended family members right on the street. Marco, I need you to be quiet, okay? Thank you. He's got about 13 or 14 extended family members right on the street. So let me tell you the story about how I, I encountered Jacob. So I was there one day during a, a, a play street day, and uh, it was a wonderful, fun day, and kids are running around uh, playing. And, and, but I really noticed Jacob because he's two years old. He just was three days after his second birthday there. And um, I just noticed that he was really good on his scooter. I mean, just two wheels. He doesn't have a third wheel. And he seems happy, and he seems emotionally pretty stable, and he's playing with you know, different kids and, and, and talking to this adult and that adult. So, but after a, about an hour and a half, I turned to Hetty. I asked Hetty, so who's he with? Who's, who's Jacob with? She looked around. She said, oh, nobody right now. And you know, he wasn't with anybody. She said, well, you know, that, that's actually not that big a deal because, well, his aunt's over there in that building and his grandmother's over there. And I've known, not only has she known Jacob his whole life, that's just two years, but Jacob's mother grew up on the same street and was on the play street 30 years ago. So there's tight, tight connections here. And you know the expression that, that you know, that comes, uh, that, that it takes a village to raise a child in, in an African village? Well, that's Lyman Place. I mean, this, this kid, his mother goes to, uh, to work every day and Jacob just hangs out in the neighborhood. Most kids, they'd have, they, they would go to daycare. They'd go to this cramped place outside of their neighborhood with a lot of people they don't know. He gets to hang out in his neighborhood with people you know, he knows and loves and has a great time. It's really nice. Another place uh, that I'd love to talk about is uh, this intersection in Portland. Um, there are many intersections like this. This is number one. This is the first one. Um, it's called Sherritt Square. What happened was, uh, in the late 90s, uh, an architect who was a res resident there named Mark Lakeman, he, he really was the mastermind, but he talked to his neighbors and, and he got them to you know, agree, hey, we're gonna take over our intersection. We don't like the fact that cars just zoom through here. This is our place. You know, this is supposed to be public property. You know, this is really our intersection. So uh, they went to the Department of Transportation in Portland and asked them, you know, hey, we got this great idea. We want to paint over the street. We want to put different installations in each corner. We want to make it into like a real, like a, like a piazza in, in, in Italy. And they turned him down. He was amazed. But when they were walking out, a guy from the transportation department grabbed him and he said, I'll give you a permit for a block party. Don't tell me what you're doing. So that's what they did. They, 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 they got the permit for the block party. They painted the street. And then they put different installations. This happens to be a kid's kind of clubhouse, different installations on each corner. And they've been doing it, they've been renewing it every year, renewing the painting, adding things to the corners, 
every year since, I think, 1998. And now there are over 20 of intersections like this in Portland, but this is number one, called Sherrod Square. Um, kids really get into it. So kids are a big part of Sherrod Square. They get into the painting of the mandala, so there's a new painting every year. And they feel like they, that this is really, this, this, it's their work of art. They, they don't like when cars go over it. Uh, this is Mark Lakeman, who is the guy that I mentioned. He's standing next to an installation on another corner. This is a, this is a book exchange stand. You have a book you don't want to read anymore, you put it in there, you take one out. And you think, well, what am I going to do with the book when I'm standing in the corner? Well, another corner, there's a couch. So you can sit, it has a living roof on top. Another corner, there's a solar-powered tea stand. So um, this is the, the, tea, the teapot here. Um, and neighbors, just because they live there and they love the place, they come out and they put water in, they put tea in. The place is, is continually kept up. Um, and this is the kids' clubhouse that I mentioned. Um, I sat and actually watched a couple different afternoons here. Kids really do come. They come, they play. They really feel like this is a, a, a place where they can come and play, sometimes on their own, a lot of times, most of the time with their parents. Uh, but the really amazing thing about this is this is, this is not a, a, a real affluent area. This is a middle-class area, and it's in the middle of a city. It's in the middle of Portland. All these toys you see here, they're out there all the time. People don't steal them. Once in a while, there's some sort of vandalism. Then they replace it right away. So it's really a, a wonderful public resource that is managed informally by people who live right there. So another neighborhood I'm going to talk about is in Davis, uh, close to here, up by uh, Sacramento. And this is a retrofit co-housing community. You guys, who's heard of co-housing? Anybody heard of co-housing here? OK, we're going to learn something about co-housing. Co -housing and then the name of the co-housing community is called N Street. It's just named after the street that it, that it faces. But a co-housing community is a community where everybody owns their own home, so it's not, it's, it's not total communal living, but they also have shared facilities. So in the case of N Street, uh, each of these homes is individually owned, but the backyard, everything in the backyard is, they all have their own property, but they share it. So they share the chicken coop and the trampoline and the play structure and the hot tub. And in this community, most communities, they also have a common house that they somehow put, put money together to buy. Uh, and in the common house, people have dinners together like three times a week, four times a week. They have a TV room. That's kind of nice. So let's say you want to watch the Academy Awards or this, you know, a football game or something. Rather than sit in your own house alone, you can go over there, walk 100 feet down the lane and watch it with other people kind of cool and you know most of the people you like you know um, that's really nice um, I want to talk about this girl Lucy um, the Lucy in this picture is four when I met her first she was one and a half and um, she was we were having dinner together I was having dinner and it wasn't one of those dinners at the common house by the way it was just even when they don't have to have dinner with each other in the common house they like to have dinner with each other every night so people smaller groups get together five, six, seven, eight people in different houses and they have dinner together because they love to be with each other. It's kind of like college dorm living um, for adults with your own house. Anyway, Lucy was at the dinner I was at um, and I figured out after looking around a little bit, there were no other Asians in the room, that she was adopted by a woman. This woman, Rebecca, like a lot of women these days, decided I'm not going to have a kid with a, with a man, so she, she went to adopt. She went to China. She adopted Lucy. She brought her back. So that was when I met Lucy back in in, uh, I think it was 2008, I don't know, 2008 or 2009. Um, well, a couple years later, Rebecca, who has no family around, Rebecca contracts cancer and dies. So, you know, what would normally happen in a situation like that? We've got a woman with no family. She just adopted a kid from another country. The kid would go into foster care. But in N Street, pretty, you know, because of, of her life before that, she's been adopted. I mean, she's been adopted formally by one family in N Street, but she's really been adopted by the whole community. So she lives with, and she, is, she has parents at one house, but another mom just takes her to Chinese lessons once a week. A dad in another house takes her to dance lessons once a week. She's in that backyard running around all over the place every day. She's got a great life. I mean, you know, this is just one picture, but she looks like she's having a good time. Um, and it's because it's a community rather than just individual homes. Really cool place. Another place in Palo Alto. Um, so I live in Menlo Park, of course. This is right next to us. 
Uh, this is, yes, Marco. Is that Jill King? This is not. This is not Jill's camp. Oh, this is oh, another one. Um, this is Iris Way, Camp Iris Way. It's it's on Embarcadero, close to 101 in Palo Alto. Um, what happened with these folks is uh, a couple moms from Iris Way read about an article about my summer camp, and they contacted me and they said I, we want to run a summer camp, and they ran this camp the first year. Now it's in its third. It was in its third year this year. It's way better than mine. It's a, unbelievable summer camp. Um, and in the last year. I think they said they know pretty much every house and who has kids in their neighborhood. It's kind of a horseshoe street. There are 75 kids total between 4 and 17 in the neighborhood, and 72 participated. 72 participated. So they had total neighborhood participation. Um, so how do you get how do you get 17 year olds to hang out with 4 year olds? Well, you bribe them. You pay them. So uh, here's a picture of uh, uh, one of the teams. This girl, I think she's about 14. You know, this boy here, he's about, he's about four, he's about five, something like that. Um, yeah, they get, they get along. But you, know, you, think of, you think about your average teenager. You know, I don't want to spend a week of my summer with a bunch of little kids. So they have a system of, of, of they have a sort of a hierarchical system of, of uh, counselors. So they have counselors in training. Those are kids that are in middle school. Then they have junior counselors. I think that's ninth grade and 10th grade. And then they have senior counselors. Uh, and they pay them a little bit of money. And yeah, it's a job. But what happens is, what, what should happen in all neighborhoods, what happened in my neighborhood, the big kids teach the little kids how to play. It's not adults playing with kids. It's kids playing with kids. Um, and so they have this wonderful dynamic in Camp, in camp Irish Way. And it's a love fest for a week. And then the hope is it'll transfer throughout the summer. And it does to some extent. So another neighborhood, a playborhood for a special needs boy. This is a place in Burlington, Vermont. It's a wonderful playborhood. Kids play wiffle ball uh, often uh, on the street or in the front yards. They play football. They ride their bikes around the block. But I want to highlight the experience of this one boy, Ben. Ben is um, a special needs kid, he, or a kid with special needs. A little different terminology. Um, he's got cerebral palsy. Uh, and I don't have a kid like this, so it's hard for me to imagine, you know, how difficult his life could be. He can't use anything below his arms. His arms have limited use. He can't see very well. He can't hear very well. He can't speak very well. But he, believe it or not, he has a full, great play life in this neighborhood. Um, and kids actually come to his door and knock on his door and ask him to come out and play. And because it's right there, he can do it. If he had to go into a van and get driven, it's not going to happen every day. It's just not going to happen. Um, and uh, his dad uh, retrofit his wheelchair with these two buttons. And like I said, he can't speak very well. He can't see very well either. But uh, the kids have recruited him to be a, an umpire in wiffle ball games. And one of those is ball and one of those is strike. And they actually want him to come out and, and umpire wiffle ball games. It's great. Um, also, his dad found this for him. This is a bike. His sisters, without adult help, that that's his, one of his sisters right up there, can actually wheel this wheelchair on there and lock it in. So he goes for spins around, spins around the neighborhood. I mean, the, the kid's having a great life. Uh, and it's all because he's got a vibrant place right where he lives. It, this would not happen if he had to get driven around. So those are all my inspiring examples. Now I'm going to talk about solutions. And uh, i got six of them. First. Moving. So not everybody moves all the time. But the fact is that in America, the average family with kids moves about once every six years. Average. So all I'm saying is, when you move, I think you should think about moving in a different way. The real estate industry doesn't really help us to find places where kids can have a good life. You know, what does the real estate industry do? Well, this is a, a Mountain View uh, listing. Um, by the way, people gasp you know, when I go outside of the Bay Area at, you know, at $749,000. <laughs> it's really hard to find something that low, uh, but uh, actually it's, it's, uh, it's very high for people outside of here. Anyway, uh, what are they selling? What are they trying to sell? What are they, what are they telling us about this house? Yeah, it's got dual pane windows. It's got hardwood floors. It's got vaulted tongue and groove ceilings. It's got forced air heating. From a kid's point of view, who cares? Who cares? Is that, you know, does that enhance a kid's quality of life? You know, we often say we're moving for our kids. Are we really moving for our kids? 
Do they want the, this high pressure school district you're moving them to? Do they want you know, the extra bedroom? Kids would love to sleep you know, double up in, in bedrooms if they have a, a, a neighborhood that's thriving, that's really happening. Um, so you know, my, my uh, recommendation is you marry the neighborhood. When you move to a house, you're not just moving into a house. Maybe I can take a step back. This is, I'm half Sicilian, so this is important to me, this, this picture. This is from The Godfather. Mm -hmm. Remember The Godfather? This is when Michael Corleone goes back, goes to Sicily, meets this beautiful woman, and uh, he decides he wants to marry her, and this is their date. So they go out for a walk, and there's all the old Sicilian ladies walking behind them. Because in Sicilian culture, like in Chinese culture, my wife's culture, when you, you don't just marry the person, you marry the family. And so my recommendation for people when they buy homes is think about marrying the neighborhood. You're not just marrying, you're not just buying the home, you're marrying the whole neighborhood. Um, and so think about you know, what kind of people are these people? I mean, when, when I, I have a whole chapter in the book about home, house hunting, you know, knock on doors, talk to them, find out if there are kids who live here. That's another thing is, you know, the number one criterion, I think, for buying a house for kids is are there other kids their age who live around there? You remember, you remember when, I don't know, you remember when uh, you were a kid and a moving truck would move up, moving somebody into a house? And I remember we'd run up to the moving truck, we had three questions. Are there kids? What ages? Boys or girls? That's all we wanted to know. And we were happy if there were kids, we weren't happy if there weren't kids. So that's, that's the number one raw material. Other things like calm streets, walkable neighborhood, um, um, a, a, an outdoor life, some, a place not where it looks like everything's pristine and people just get in their car and drive away, but a place where it looks like they live outside, where they're walking all the time. Things like that are important. Okay, number two, make a neighborhood hangout. So, um, you know, you're, you're living in a place, but the fact is kids are not going to go outside, kids are not going to go outside if there's nothing going on. And the best way to assure that something's going on is, th is if there's a place where people can go where there's something happening. And so this is, uh, comes from the TV show Cheers. Um, and I had my Cheers when I was a little kid. We had that street between my house and the house across the street. We also had, we also had a, a, a woods down the street where there was a, a tree house. Now, I've tried to do that with our yard, and I think we've done a pretty good job. You come our, by our house pretty much any afternoon after school, there's something going on. And people do come by, just drop by and see what's going on. That's what it has to be. Um, the big question that you know, you have to sort of answer affirmatively is what are the chances that something's going on? Because when a kid has free time, a kid thinks, okay, I could see, I could turn on my video game, 100% probability I'm going to get something. I could turn on the TV, same thing, 100% probability I'll find something on some station that I'll watch. But what's the chances if I walk outside that there's something going on? For most neighborhoods today, 5%, zero, they're not going to even try. So th there has to be something, some place out there that is so compelling that I think there's a 40, 50, 60% chance that I'm going to have success or else I'm not going to try. Number three, that's Marco when he was about, uh, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks old, something like that. Um, keep preschoolers' lives simple. You know, human beings, obviously, we've evolved over, over millennia. It's just the past 50 years, 100 years that we've had all this technology. Uh, you know, cars were just invented over a little over 100 years ago. Uh, television, 50 years. Uh, then we've got, you know, the computer and the internet and video games, that's about 10, 15 years, something like that. But we've evolved over millennia. So human beings, babies especially, have a natural need to interact with the world, the physical world, not to sit and watch, or not to sit in a car seat and be quiet. You know, they want to be out and about, they want to be touching stuff. So, obviously, limit screen time. Simple, you've heard it lots. It makes, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And, and our, our philosophy in our house is, we don't have screens. We have, we have a screen that we could turn on and put on a YouTube video. And we do that in the winter, maybe for every other day for 10 minutes, that's it. During the summer, it doesn't go on at all. And that's harsh, I know. But in some ways it's nice, it's better that way because then the kids don't know what they're missing. That's Marco riding to school. Don't drive when you can walk or bike. Think about what you, when you put a kid into a car, especially a little kid into a car. Okay? They have no control whatsoever over what's going on. You put them in that car seat, they can't drive, they can't turn on the ignition, they can't steer. 
and you put them in this crappy seat, and they're staring at the back of your head. It's a really low quality experience, and it's the most unsafe thing they'll do all day. But what happens when they're riding a bike or when they're walking? They're peers. They're doing the same thing you're doing. They're doing exactly. They can veer off. They can walk over and pick some flowers. They can throw rocks. They can go and say hello to somebody. Marco, try. Okay. Try to calm down, okay? Um, and so Marco's been riding his bike every day to school, every day, other than maybe once every couple months, every day since he was starting kindergarten. And now, it's a mile and a half ride. He rides home every day on his own. And as you'll see in a second, he doesn't always ride straight home. He does other things. And going to school, he can ride alone, but I like to be with him, so I try to ride with him when I can. Um, and my four and a half year old, Nico, he's riding every day to school too, not with us, but he'll, he'll soon, in a couple years, start riding on his own as well. Um, make a village. So um, what I'm trying to say here is make the place you live into a close communal village where you know people, where they know you, where, you know, where they know your kids, where you know their kids. If you can make that into a nice, comfortable place, then you'll be comfortable letting your kids go. And other kids will show up at your door because they're comfortable with you. All neighborhoods have hidden treasures. This is a woman named Karen who Marco and Nico and his other boy Owen met uh, playing a scavenger hunt game. So remember our driveway? Every year during our neighborhood summer camp, the kids play a scavenger hunt game. They move a game piece on, you know, from lot to lot. When they land on a lot, they have a list of things they have to get. They had a, so Marco and, and Nico and Owen had to go to this woman's house. She lives a block away from us, we never met her. She's an empty nester, really nice lady. Now we see her, now we say hello. It's great. There's a lot of, there's a lot of hidden treasures. And we've got Hugh. Hugh is our neighborhood magician. If you saw Hugh walking down the street, you'd probably walk the other way. He's actually a great guy. He's a great guy. He's a magician. He comes to my house like two or three times a year, does a free magic show. You see him on the street, he pulls stuff out of his beard. Um, he also has an organic garden in his backyard with a compost pile. And Marco goes over there. He's teaching Marco about organic gardening. He's a great neighborhood asset. Most people don't know about people like that who live in the neighborhood. So Marco, Marco, put the hand up. Okay. So, um, it's kind of hard to see here the way the projector is, but I drew an outline around all these houses and around the creek. That was Marco's village. That was the place where Marco could roam on his own when he was six years old. And that just didn't happen when he turned six. From the time he was four years old when we moved here, every day we're outside and we're talking to different families. These are families with kids his age who he knows. These families here, these are, these are uh, adults who don't have kids, and we know them as well. We're out there, we're talking to those people. He, he knows the plants, he knows the driveways, he knows the shrubbery, he knows the way the houses look, he's, he's in, the, in the yards. He knows this place very well. So we're comfortable with him roaming around on his own in the neighborhood, in our, in our creek over there, which is very important to us. Then the next year, when he's seven, this, is a, this depicts a, sort of a broader view of his range. This is his path one day from school after school. So our neighborhood is up there uh, where home is. See home up there? Um, but Marco's been riding to school every day. He's got lots of friends, people he knows along the way, lots of kids riding. One day after school, as a first grader, I told Marco, Marco, don't go home. Okay? I want you to go to the barbershop. The barbershop is called Golden Shears in downtown Menlo Park. We go to Mo Golden Shears once a month, every month of their lives. We don't go to other barbershops. They know the people who work, who work there. They know the place very well. Oh, Marco, I need you to stay away from me, okay? Yeah, after the break, show up at Evan's house. Uh, Evan's house? Yeah. That day? So he did something after I didn't know about. Show. <laughs> <laughs> he did something I didn't know about. Um, so we'll, we'll add Evan in. So, so I told him, after school today, Ride to Golden Shears. So he had a, he, he knows the neighborhood, so he had to map it out in his mind where he had to go. So I took his brothers from home, we rode over, and Marco took this blue line, he went to the barber shop, he got there, we weren't there. So he locked his bike up, he walked inside, he sat down in the barber chair, because Sam is there. Sam's the guy who's gonna cut his hair, Marco knows Sam. Then I bring his brothers, we're getting our hair cut, Marco's done, Marco wants to go. So I said to Marco, Marco, why don't you go to the bike shop? 
another place we go to all the time called Menlo Bello. I said, Marco, you know, get your brakes adjusted. So Marco rode his bike on that red line. He didn't go up to El Camino, because I don't want him to ride on El Camino. He goes to, to Menlo Bello up there. And then somewhere in there, apparently, I didn't know this until just now, he went over to another street, Partridge, and stopped by Evan's house and said hello to Evan. It's the same street. No. It's just a couple of miles. It's one over. He, Evan's on Partridge. Oh, it's Partridge. Josh, no. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So Marco went to see a friend, and then he went home. Pretty extraordinary afternoon for a seven-year-old. But you know, if, if you actually look back and hear about kids 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they did this sort of thing all the time. This is not something that's beyond the ability of kids. Uh, and this is Marco at age eight. So he's developed a new skill, not just navigating, but arranging his own play sessions. Think about that. All these kids have these play dates, and I've been arranging play dates two or three a week for a couple years now, three years now for Marco, and, I'm, and now I'm doing it for his younger brother. But just now, just this school year, Marco's starting to arrange his own play session. So this day, and I don't know the exact times, Marco, don't correct me exactly, okay? But around 12.15, one day, he made an invitation to a friend named Jake. Hey, let's play after school. Jake is managed by his parents, just like most kids, so Jake doesn't know exactly what he can do. So Marco rides, at 1.15 to Jake's house. Jake's gets, Jake gets driven to Jake's house. And then they negotiate. They talk about, okay, what are we gonna do? Where are we gonna go? Are, we, are you allowed to do this? Yes, I'm allowed to do this. And Marco's hanging out waiting to, to, for them to figure it out. At 1.40 he calls me. He doesn't have his own phone. He remembers my phone number. He, he just put, committed that to memory and borrowed a phone from a grown-up. Dad, I'm at Jake. I think we're going home in a little bit. I just want you to know. <coughs> and then I called the babysitter who was home. So tell her that Marco's not home yet. And then about two o'clock, Marco and Jake left. They rode to our house and they played and they managed their own play session. It, it, I mean, it's actually quite remarkable like, by today's standards, but it's something that kids can do. And Marco's doing this sort of thing like every other day, kind of managing his own play session. So here's some ideas for making a village. Things that we do, play with your kids in your front yard or street, knock on neighbor's doors. Well, that's a big one, knock on neighbor's doors. When we moved into our neighborhood, we had next door neighbors, we still have the same next door neighbors. Next door to us, they had two kids, same ages as two of our kids. We went over to their house, we knocked on their door. We knew they were home. They didn't answer the door. A couple days later, same thing. They didn't answer the door. Finally, I happened to see the mom outside, and I said, hey, you know, we knocked on your door last night and a couple nights before that. She said, oh, that was you. She never thought that someone she'd want to see would be at her door. So now in our neighborhood, people knock on doors. Kind of break, broken that cultural stigma. Um, knock on doors, you know? Why not? Um, walk or bike in your neighborhood, so on and so forth. Number five, what movie is this from? Wayne's World. Wayne's World was prophetic, prophetic because uh, back in, I think it was early 90s, something like that, late 80s, early 90s, something like that. Um, there's a movie about a couple guys who were in their 20s, who were living with their parents, have no real job, have no real girlfriend, don't know what they're going to do with their life, and have no money. Sound familiar? It's kind of what most 20-somethings are doing these days, partially because of, uh, of economic situation, but not, but not totally. Well, I think that parents have a role to play in trying to keep this from happening. Uh, they're not encouraging self-reliance. I remember when I was a kid, parents used to brag to each other, oh, my kid can ride to school on his own. My kid can go to the store and buy something at the store. Now, you know, parents have no shame. You see parents walking with their, their teenagers and making all decisions, doing everything for them uh, up until college. And sometimes they're managing their kids' lives from college. Really amazing. Um, <coughs> there's good news and bad news about parents' parents time with kids. <coughs> Studies have shown that parents are spending more time with kids. They're spending more time with kids today than they did decades ago. Even though mothers are working way more. So what are mothers not doing? They're not cooking, they're not cleaning, they're not doing as much domestic stuff. But this is good for kids. The parents are spending more time with their kids. The problem is, this is the way they're spending time with their kids. They're controlling their kids, 
and they're spending a lot of time trying to get their kids to, to do this activity, to do this particular thing, to get them into college. And personally, I don't think it's, it's a good way to spend time with kids. So um, I'm interested in parents encouraging kids to be self-reliant, being present, but being facilitators more than controllers. So there are things that parents can do. Parents can make kids do chores. And around our house, we haven't succeeded in getting kids, our kids to clean up all the time, but they're into certain chores. Marco is really into gardening, big time. And it's not just a chore for him, it's a business. So I bought Marco, so Marco's in charge of our garden now. And uh, I bought him a scale he's, and a calculator. And he goes to Farmer's Market, he writes down the prices at Farmer's Market. That's a good deal. If you can get Farmer's Market prices for your vegetable garden, you're doing well. And then he weighs them, and then he writes them down, and then we work on the calculator, and we figure out how much I owe him. So he makes money. Help kids find a job or start a business. Teach kids to pick up a sports game. Big one with me, really hard to do. Um, let them walk or bike to school on their own. Encourage the independent roaming. Here's my last recommendation. And this is for kids who get a little bit older. We got some kids here who this is relevant for. Um, I talked about you know, the fact that we don't have cell phone, we don't have, uh, excuse me, we don't have t television in our house, we don't have video games. Um, however, you, know, you don't want to just totally cut off kids from technology. Let's face it, we live in a world that is technologically advanced. We live in Silicon Valley. Kids want to use technology. And at a certain point, it becomes vital to their social lives. Um, the thing is that cell phones have been shown, and there's a study from the, from the Pew Center for Research on the Internet that shows that, that teens believe that cell phones is the number one ticket for them to independence to being able to, to get out of the house and not be under their parents' gaze, not to be under adults' gaze. I think that's a good thing. Another part of that study says that, that parents and their teen children think that cell phones increase their, the intimacy of their conversations. They don't just talk about what's going on today. They actually share each other's thoughts and feelings more. I think that's a good thing. There's a lot of bad things about cell phones, but I think in, in general, cell phones are a good thing. And more to the point, I think you should make it a smartphone. And give it early. Why, why do I say a smartphone? Because smartphones have one critical piece that I'm, is very important to me. It's a GPS chip. So the GPS chip, uh, then I have a map. And I can start to navigate the world. So if I can see a map on Google Maps or I can see a map for other applications, then you know, think about how great kids are at navigating, you know, used to be at navigating Mario's world or World of Warcraft. If they have a, if they have a phone with a GPS chip and a map, they can navigate the world better than adults can. Uh, of course, you know, prohibit use on roadways, yes. Prohibit use in the home. Well, not everybody, everybody's gonna be able to do that, but at least at the dinner table, in the bedroom, come on. Can't do these things. But out in the world, it's a good thing. And this is me, actually, um, my concluding slide. Uh, the real world can become their game board. So kids love video games. There's a whole new genre of video games called uh, place-based games, location-based games, there's different, different names, where the game board, in this case for us, the game board was Times Square. We were playing a game called Paparazzi, and in the game, there are teams of three. Our team, we had the celebrity, this guy with the, the red scarf, I forget what you call it, a, what do you call these things? A boa, a boa, yeah, he's got a boa, and we're his entourage. And all these other teams are running around trying to take his picture. And we're following them on, we're following the different teams on our cell phones, and we have these different places we have to go to. I gotta tell you, we learned Times Square, we learned the minutia of the buildings and the, the street vendors way better than people who've probably been there for years. We got to know lots of people. So we were very immersed, very immersed in the place, in the here and now. Unlike when most people use cell phones, they're staring at that screen and they have no idea what's going on. In that case, with a location-based game, the screen was a facilitator to help me to see the world better. So actually, this new technology, I'm very hopeful that it can actually immerse people more into the world than they, than they have in otherwise if they're using the GPS chip. So the real world be, can become their game board. And so I think mobile phones can be a really good thing. Um, so that's all I have to say. I have a lot more I could say. I could tell you about my new book that I'm working on. Um, but thank you for being a patient audience, and I'd uh, love to hear comments and questions. Thank you. Yeah.